Hello, and welcome to this Nansig presentation on myopathies. This presentation will aim to give an overview of this broad and heterogeneous group of conditions. A few of the more common pathological processes will be described in greater detail, but these are by no means exhaustive. Differentiating between myopathy and neuropathy is a clinically useful skill, and the main differences between these conditions will also be described. Finally, we will cover some of the more common myopathy presentations and take a look at important investigation and management options for these. Myopathy is defined as any disorder of the skeletal muscles. There can be many causes involving abnormalities of muscle cell structure or metabolism. Epidemiology varies depending on the underlying cause, but they can normally be divided by age of onset and rate of progression. Congenital, but also mitochondrial myopathies, may present in the infant. Typically, congenital myopathies have a known genetic basis and are defined largely by the pathological findings within muscle, for example, nemaline rods. These are very rare overall, but are the most common myopathies in this age group. The most common childhood onset myopathy is that of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Childhood onset myopathies tend to have slower progression and more chronic courses when compared to adult onset myopathies. Thyroid disorders and excessive steroid use are among the most common non-inflammatory causes in adults. However, inflammatory causes are important differentials in older patients. As already discussed, myopathy is an umbrella term for a varied group of conditions that can be arranged by the type of pathology involved. They arise from the interruption of normal muscular metabolic processes, either in an inherited or acquired fashion. Notable inherited myopathies include muscular dystrophy, congenital myopathy, and metabolic causes, such as glycogen storage diseases, primary mitochondrial disorders, and the channelopathies. Acquired myopathies encompass inflammatory muscle conditions such as dermatomyositis and inclusion body myositis, infective causes, toxic forms precipitated most commonly by corticosteroids or chronic alcohol dependence, and a host of systemic diseases that may impair normal muscle function. I will briefly outline the key pathophysiological concepts of the more common forms of myopathy. Mutations in both nuclear and mitochondrial genes cause the so-called mitochondrial myopathies. Diseases involving the mitochondrial DNA show maternal inheritance, but this is less common than novel mutations. The mitochondrial diseases may present in young adulthood and manifest with proximal muscle weakness, sometimes with severe involvement of the extraocular muscles. The weakness may be accompanied by other neurological symptoms, lactic acidosis, and cardiomyopathy. Duchenne type muscular dystrophy is caused by a recessive deletion or defect in the short arm of chromosome X, leading to an absence of intracellular anchoring provided by dystrophin. Finally, thyrotoxic myopathy shows pathology related to structural changes in motor end plates, leading to muscle fibre degradation, weakness and fatigue. Research indicates that there are decreased levels of acetylcholinesterase occupying the neuromuscular junction. This leads to increasing muscle fibre stimulation. It's believed that these changes in motor end plates and acetylcholinesterase could be the result of overstimulation of thyroxine blocking the axoplasmic flow of trophic factors. Now let's examine some important differences between myopathies and neuropathies. Although clinical signs may not be clear cut, some aspects of the presentation may help to differentiate between these different pathologies. Muscle disorders tend to be more gradual in onset and present with proximal muscle weakness, affecting activities of daily living, such as hair combing and climbing stairs. Importantly, tendon reflexes are preserved and specific muscle groups may be affected. Spontaneous muscle pain at rest and local tenderness may indicate an inflammatory myopathy. Oddly firm or lumpy muscles could indicate pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophies, such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's important to always look for evidence of systemic disease 
as these are more likely in myopathy. Neuropathy, on the other hand, is much more likely to present alongside symptoms such as bladder and sensory problems. We will now explore a few key aspects of the most notable myopathies by age of presentation. Although a rare cause of neonatal hypotonia, congenital myopathies should be considered if no central nervous system etiology is found. Floppiness and a non-progressive or slowly progressive course are characteristic. Mitochondrial diseases are less rare, with an estimated prevalence of 1 per 8,000 population. Many syndromes have been described. Pearson and Lee syndromes will be more likely to present in the infant, however this is not the case for all mitochondrial myopathies. Exercise intolerance, proximal muscle weakness, poor growth, neurodevelopmental delay, seizures, ophthalmoplegia, deafness and diabetes may represent other systemic manifestations of mitochondrial disease. Take a look at these photographs. Observe how the child rises to standing. Can you describe the sign and suggest a diagnosis? Pause the video here and see if you are correct. The classical presentation of a childhood onset myopathy is that of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In boys presenting with delayed motor milestones and mild speech delay, this diagnosis should always be considered. Weakness of proximal girdle muscles leads to a number of important signs including a waddling lordotic gait, pseudohypertrophy of the calves as muscle fibres are replaced by fat and connective tissue, and Gower's sign, seen here, which is observed as children attempt to stand using their legs as support for their upper body. Becker muscular dystrophy causes symptoms at a later age and the rate of progression tends to be slower and more variable. This group of conditions is an important cause of adult onset myopathy. All three inflammatory myopathies are most common in middle age, perhaps most significantly for inclusion body myositis, which is much more common in the over 50s. Inclusion body myositis is more common in men, unlike dermatomyositis and polymyositis, which are twice as common in women. Presenting features are of muscle weakness progressing over weeks and months. Dermatomyositis and polymyositis have the same pattern of proximal weakness, the main difference being the presence of dermatological features, namely a violet rash on sun-exposed areas, heliotrope rash over the eyelids, and Gottron's papules on the hands. Inclusion body myositis will produce more distal and variable clinical signs, for example asymmetrical weakness, foot drop and dysphagia. Administration of corticosteroids is one of the commonest causes of proximal muscle weakness. Synthetic glucocorticoids, such as dexamethasone, appear to be a particularly potent causative agent. Biopsy reveals selective atrophy of a subtype of fast twitch fibres. Corticosteroids may also contribute to weakness by causing hypokalemia. Statin myositis is a rare but significant unwanted effect in a small group of patients. Consider lower doses in elderly, hypothyroid, female patients who are taking numerous medications that may affect hepatic metabolism. The combination of muscle pain and a significant rise in creatine kinase should be sufficient evidence to stop the medication. Thyroid disease, both hypothyroidism and thyrotoxicosis, may result in myopathy, and the corresponding clinical signs should be sought to enable diagnosis. Electrolyte imbalances, such as high or low potassium, may cause the phenomenon of periodic paralysis, which may also be associated with the channelopathies. Abnormalities of calcium and magnesium may also be to blame. These can be primary or secondary to another pathological process, such as Conn syndrome or corticosteroid toxicity. Diuretics may lead to potassium-based biochemical abnormalities. Hyperparathyroidism may lead to hypercalcemia. Numerous investigations may be of use in diagnosis and determining severity. Initial blood tests will identify whether muscle disease is present. Creatine kinase is most commonly used, however aldolase, 
lactate dehydrogenase, and liver function tests may also indicate this. A full blood count will highlight infective causes or anemia of chronic disease. Urea and electrolytes will shed light on biochemical causes. Look at thyroid function tests and parathyroid hormone levels for endocrine causes. Inflammatory disease is highlighted by erythrocyte sedimentation rate and possibly CRP. Specific autoantibodies such as anti-MI2 for dermatomyositis and anti-JO1 for polymyositis, as well as others related to rheumatological disease, may be of use. If mitochondrial or metabolic myopathy is suspected, do a serum lactate. The electromyogram may be useful in diagnosing myopathy, especially in the case of myotonic dystrophy. However, the absence of abnormality on EMG does not exclude myopathy. Steroid and metabolic myopathies may produce normal EMGs. Biopsy. This test is most useful when diagnosing inflammatory, infective or congenital myopathy. However, care must be taken when selecting the site of the sample to avoid spurious results. The figure shows anemoline myopathy. Management is largely supportive for an inherited myopathy. Conditions such as congenital myopathy or muscular dystrophy benefit most from physiotherapy and occupational therapy, as well as contracture management, nutritional support, and any genetic counselling. Duchenne muscular dystrophy may benefit from daily corticosteroid treatment. It's also important to monitor for complications relating to kyphoscoliosis and respiratory cardiac or bulbar muscle involvement. In acquired myopathies, treatment is targeted towards the underlying cause, for example treating any underlying infection or stopping the administration of the causative agent in a toxic myopathy. Inflammatory disorders benefit most from oral and intravenous steroids, intravenous immunoglobulin, as well as methotrexate, azathioprine and cyclophosphamide. Unfortunately, the nature of inclusion body myositis renders it typically resistant to treatment with immunosuppressants. Briefly, we will cover some non-typical but important disorders. For patients who present with rhabdomyolysis, treatment is aimed at preventing kidney failure in the acute setting. Vigorous hydration with close monitoring of kidney function and electrolytes is paramount. In patients with an underlying metabolic myopathy, Education about following a more moderate exercise program and avoiding intense exercise and fasting is useful in preventing recurrent episodes. Patients with prolonged stays in the intensive care unit are at risk for developing critical illness myopathy. Information on its exact incidence is unknown. However, a number of studies have shown it to be equal in prevalence to critical illness polyneuropathy. For these patients, optimization of nutrition and the initiation of intensive physical therapy over a period of several months have been shown to be beneficial. Malignant hypothermia is a severe reaction to anaesthetic agents and depolarizing muscle blocking agents, such as succimethonium. It manifests through muscle rigidity, fever, muscle necrosis, myoglobinuria, metabolic acidosis, kidney failure, as well as cardiac arrhythmias. Aggressive treatment with oxygen, intensive body cooling measures, hydration and dantrolene can be life-saving. Thank you very much for listening.